Hello all, welcome to Yadarth IA's Current Affairs Roundup classes and we have completed GS1 and GS2 syllabus uh, uh, for January to March 2023 and now we are going to start with GS3 syllabus part 1 for current affairs January to March 2023. First topic for today is coal bird survey of 2023. So this was in use because the 32nd Asian water bird count at coal wetlands which is in Kerala has marked the lowest sighting in the three decades. So this has been the lowest sighting in the three decades that's why it was in news. So from the examination point of view you should understand where is this coal wetlands. It is in Kerala and you also have to understand that this is the lowest sighting in the three decades. The water bird count at coal wetlands was held as a part of annual Asian water bird count 2023. So the background for this is this survey is the water bird count which was held at coal wetlands as a part of the annual Asian water bird count 2020. 23. The survey was jointly organized by the Kerala State Forest Department, Kerala Agricultural University and Coal Birders. So a total of 9,904 birds of 90 wetland dependent species were counted this year, which is a decline from the last year survey. And please note that is the, this is the lowest sighting in the three decades. So the old data on the Asian water count of 2022 has been uploaded in the eBird site. So this is the lowest sighting. You should remember that point and it is a part of 32nd Asian water bird count and where this coal wetlands is located is important topic for you. So now let's see where is this coal wetlands from the examination point of view. So this is a Ramsar site and it is an important bird area. So this is a Ramsar site and an important bird area. In this map, you can see the blue color, the light blue ones are the coal wetland. So here it starts from Malapuram from Bharatpula river to Chalakudi Pula. So, so uh, this is uh, stretched all over from Malapuram, Trishur area of Kerala. So it spreads over Trishur and Malapuram districts of Kerala. And it is between the banks of Chalakudi River in the south. This is Chalakudi River and Bharatpula River in the north. So it is between Bharatpura and Chalakudi Pula uh, rivers. Uh, and it is spread in two districts that is Malapuram and Trishur of Kerala. So this coal wetlands lie below the sea level. Please remember this point that it lies below the sea level and it gets submerged in the monsoon. So the cultivation is done after the monsoon when water levels are low and fresh water rainwater seeps down as groundwater. Please remember this coal wetlands location. It is a Ramsar site and also an important bird area. This wetlands, it gets submerged in the monsoon. That is, it is, it is lying below the sea level and whatever cultivation they are doing here in Malapuram and Trishur in this coal wetland, uh, coal wetlands, it is done soon after the monsoon when the water levels are low and the fresh rainwater seeps down as groundwater. So this is very very important from your uh, uh, from your GS3 syllabus point of view. So this is the 32nd Asian water bird count and it was held at cold coal wetlands in Kerala uh, and it, it has marked the lowest sighting in the three decades. Okay. And you should remember the location of this coal wetlands and the important thing is it lies below the sea level and uh, it gets submerged in the monsoon and cultivation will be done after the monsoon when the water levels are low and fresh rainwater seeps down as groundwater. Next topic is about this Indian Science Con 
Congress. This is the 108th edition of this Indian Science Congress. This was in news because it will be held at Rashtra Sant Tuka Doji Maharaj Nagpur University in Maharashtra. So this uh, Congress mainly focuses on the ways to increase the representation of women in STEM fields. STEM means science, technology, engineering and mathematics fields. So this uh, particular session of Congress, that is 108th session of Congress, wants to increase how we can increase the representation of women in our country in STEM fields, that is science, technology, engineering and mathematics fields. So it also provides them with equal access to STEM education, research and economic participation. The theme for this year is science and technology for sustainable development with women empowerment. So we are fo focusing on women empowerment as well as sustainable development along with science and technology. Please remember the points which I have uh, underlined here. This uh, a special program is conducted uh, alongside this uh, Indian Science Congress uh, which showcases the contribution of women in science and technology. Uh, those are Children's Science Congress. This will help to stimulate the scientific interest and temperament mainly among children. Second thing, Farmers Science Congress. This will provide a platform to improve the bioeconomy and attract youth to agriculture. Third one is Tribal Science Congress. It acts as a platform for scientific display of indigenous ancient knowledge system and practice along with focusing on the empowerment of tribal women. So Children Science Congress, Farmer Science Congress and Tribal Science Congress are held alongside this Indian Science Congress. We also have to know about this Indian Science Congress Association because uh, the topic mainly is on Indian Science Congress but you should also know about this association uh, uh, so that you will uh, you will uh, not miss any uh, point from the examination point. So the Indian Science Congress Association ISCA is a professional body under the Department of Science and Technology under the Ministry of Science and Technology. So please remember that it is uh, under the Ministry of Science and uh, Technology. So this association organizes the annual Indian Science Congress and the first Congress was held in 1914 during the British era. So the association is a professional body under the Department of Science and Technology, Ministry of Science and Technology and it organizes the annual Indian Science Congress and was the first Congress was held in 1914. What are the objectives of this association? One is advancing and promoting the cause of science in India. Uh, holding an, an annual congress at a suitable place in India. They want to, ha uh, they will hold this congress at different places of India like Nagpur, Pune, Bangalore, Delhi, Shillong, etc. And they publish proceedings, journals, transactions and other publications uh, when, then, when this congress is happening. It secures and manages funds and endowments for the promotion of science among others. Okay. Uh, next is this Sarsa Rivulet. What is this Sarsa Rivulet and why it was in news? Because it is associated with the pivotal movement in Guru Gobind Singh's life uh, uh, and is very important from our environment and conservation point of view because this river is dying. This was in news because it is a pivotal moment for Guru Gobind Singh's life and uh, now from the conservation point of view also we are interested here because this river is now dying and it is located in Punjab. So where this river originates, it uh, originates in the Sivalik Hills in the Himachal Pradesh. So the origin of this uh, Sarsa rivulet is in Himachal Pradesh in the Sivalik Hills. It flows through Solan district which borders Punjab, enters Rupnagar district in Punjab and eventually flows into Satlaj. So it is a uh, 
tributary of Satluj. Coming from Himachal Pradesh, it flows here in Punjab and it goes to Satluj. So the Bati Bartoli Wala Nala Ghad Industrial Complex, one of India's largest manufacturing hubs, is located near the Nar uh, Sarsa. This is one of the reasons because see, here it is a manufacturing hub and a lot of pollution is happening here. So that is one of the reasons why this river is dying. Uh, Faramishal waste be is being discharged into Sarsa rivulet from this uh, BBN Industrial Complex as affected the river's biota. It made the water unfit for human consumption and also causing the area to become prone to antimicrobial resistance. That is why the rivulet is dying here. Please uh, remember the location and the origin of this river. It is in Sivalik Hills of Himachal Pradesh. The reason mainly why it is dying is because of this uh, Bati Barto. Baroti Wala Nala Ghad Industrial Complex. This pharma waste is being discharged into this uh, river and it is making the water unfit for human consumption and making this area where uh, the BBN area uh, prone to antimicrobial resistance. So on December 21, uh, uh, from the historical point of view, also it is important. Uh, though it is GS3, I'm, uh, it is also important from the GS1 point of view. In December 21, 1704, a, bottle, a battle took place on this banks of River Sarsa. It is between Khalsa and the Mughal armies. Here, Guru Gobind Singh's mother and his two younger sons were separated from the main party which is consisting of the Guru and the Sarsa was where the Guru's family got separated in the winter of 1704 and never got together again. So Gurudwara Parivar Vichor Sahib stands on the spot where the battle of Sarsa took place and the family was separated. So you should remember here that the uh, battle of Sarsa was between Khalsa and the Mughal armies and it is also important from Guru Gobind Singh's uh, life because his mother and his two younger sons were separated from him and they never got together again. So first thing from here is the, uh, the origin of river Sarsa and uh, it crosses, it flows through two states that is Imachal Pradesh and Punjab and it is dying because of this BBN industrial complex situated there and uh, the water being unfit for human consumption. Next is about, uh, about the moon missions in 2023. So we should know about We should know about this moon missions in 2023. So various moon missions from national space agencies like uh, not only ISRO but also from other uh, countries are also launching this moon missions this year. So various moon missions from national space agencies and private space companies la are lined to head in 2023. So, iSpace's Akuto R mission. This is a lunar lander developed by iSpace. This is a Japanese space technology. Though it was launched in December 2022, only ex it is only expected to reach the moon by April 2023. So, it was launched along with the Rashid rover. This is this rover is United Arab Emirates' first lunar rover and the NASA's lunar flashlight. You should also understand there were uh, along with this iSpace Akuto R mission which was by the Japanese space technology we launched this Rashid rover of United Arab Emirates that was its first lunar rover and NASA's lunar flashlight. Now what is this NASA's lunar flashlight? It is the mission's trajectory will take it far beyond the moon to understand the presence of water in the moon's south pole. So the lunar flashlight was sent uh, in the Hakuto R mission uh, because it wanted to understand the presence of water in the moon's south pole and it is by NASA. Rashid rover. This was United Arab Emirates first lunar rover named after the Dubai's royal family. Next is Chandrayaan-3. The mission was scheduled to launch a bold uh, launch vehicle Mark 3 that is LVM-3 in June 20. 13 okay uh, sorry this is june 2023 20, sorry 
It will be a follow-up to the ISRO's Chandrayaan-2 mission which consists of a lunar lander and a lunar rover. The propulsion module behaves like a communications relay satellite for the spacecraft that land. So Chandrayaan-1 was launched in October 2008. It had an orbiter of 100 km from the lunar surface, 11 payload, 6 from India, 3 from Europe and 2 from USA. Discovery of water on the lunar surface was an important aspect from this mission. Mapping of chemicals and 3D topography. And in 2019, we targeted this Chandrayaan-2. Uh, the orbiter was 100 km from the lunar surface. Vikram lander with a soft landing near the South Pole. Pragyan rover in situ for in situ experiments and 14 Indian payloads were there. The next is Russia's Luna 25 mission. So please understand here, the first one was Hakuto R mission. Which it carried two payloads. One is from the UAE, that is uh, the Rashid rover. The other one is uh, NASA's lunar flashlight. But this mission was from uh, Japan. The second one was Chandrayaan-3. This is by India. The third one is Russia's Luna 25 mission. So, Russia's Roscosmos Space Agency plans to launch its Luna 25 mission to the moon in July 2023. This Luna 2025 is a planned lunar lander mission since the Soviet Union's Luna 24 mission in 1976. The Luna 25 mission is scheduled to land at moon's south pole at a crater called Bogolaswarsky. So next one is SpaceX's Dear Moon. This week-long lunar tourism mission is scheduled to happen in 2023. The mission will be launched on SpaceX's Starship launch vehicle. So we have discussed here uh, Akuto R mission of Japan with two payloads that is a Rashid rover of UAE and it is the first lunar rover from UAE. NASA's lunar flashlight Chandrayaan-3 of India. Lunar 25 mission of Roscosmos, Russia and dear moon of SpaceX. Next, next topic we are going to see here is pyro regions. So this pyro regions was in news because summer 2022 saw 20-year freak fires in the Europe's regions historically immune, close to normal in fire-prone areas. So the concept of this pyro regions classifies land beyond political classifications covering areas with specific fire regimes. These pyro regions share similar characteristics such as fire size, frequency, seasonality and intensity which ultimately determine the fire impacts. So it provides a better lens through which to apprehend fire spatial heterogeneity. The spiro regions do not follow the administrative, yet ecological or climate borders and it can be seen as a practical and straightforward way of describing the fire patterns across the Europe. Here you can see the pyro regions. The blue ones are the low, fi low fire prone ones, that is the Scandinavian countries, etc. The cold season fire uh, are in the green regions and the fire prones are in the uh, orange ones, orange color and highly fire prones are in red colors. So in a recent study which was presented a pan-European pyrogeography uh, featuring four distinctive pyro regions across the continent uh, uh, was done to understand the similarities and the differences among the fire regimes are important to inform the fire management and prevention here. So this uh, global warming has been shown uh, to increase the frequency and magnitude of the fire weather conditions as observed during 2022 and the pyro regions also help stimulate simulate the future changes of fire patterns as the planet warms. So please understand where is this pyro region and what is it, what it is related to. Next is the domestic systematically important banks DSIB. So the Reserve Bank of India has released 2022 list of domestic systematically important banks that is DSIBs. Uh, they are the State Bank of India, ICICI Bank, HDFC Bank have again been named as domestic systematically important banks by RBI in the 2022 list. This uh, systematically important banks are nothing but the banks uh, which are too big to 
fail and they they are continued functioning is critical for the uninterrupted availability of essential banking services to the real economy and the genesis is the financial stability board in consultation with the basel committee on banking supervision and national authorities has identified the global systematically important banks since 2011 and similarly rbi has identified the domestic systematically important banks since 2015 so these banks are too big to fail too big to fail actually and these banks are classified into five grades or buckets the rbi will announce the list every august starting from uh, this year and the banks will have to fulfill extra capital requirement norms that is common equity tier 1 capital and the banks must meet the extra norms in 3 years by april 1 2019 the common equity tier 1 capital usually comprises a bank's equity capital retained earnings and shared premium So what is this domestic uh, systematically important banks the RBI has issued the framework for dealing with this domestic systematically important banks in July 2014 so internationally we had this uh, systematically important banks by this basel committee uh, since 2011 and RBI started to identify it from 2015 before that there was a notification or the framework issued by the RBI in July 20 14 and this notification of the framework required to disclose the banks which are designated as domestic systematically important banks and place them in the buckets depending on systemic importance scores the criteria involves to be listed as dsib is a bank needs to have assets which exceeds 2% of the national gdp The classification are placed across the five buckets based on the level of their importance with bucket 5 representing the most important domestic systematically important banks and there are no bucket 5 DSIB in India what are the requirements so the banks classified as domestic systematically important banks are subjected to additional common equity tier 1 capital requirements in addition to the capital conservation buffer so along with the capital conservation buffer these dsibs should have additional capital requirements and in addition uh, to this uh, CET one requirement is provisioned as a percentage of risk weighted assets RWA. The additional requirement for DSIBs was phased in from April one two thousand sixteen and became fully effective from April one twenty nineteen. The next is uh, about termites and global warming. This was in news because a study revealed that the Earth gets warmer. As the Earth gets warmer, the termites will rapidly spread across the world, which in turn leads to a further rise in global temperatures. Got it? So as the Earth is getting warmer, the termites will rapidly spread across the world, and this in turn will further rise in the global temperature. Please read this statement. Two three times because you might get in your examination. So let's see about these termites. They are insects which feed on wood and dead plant matter. So it is on feeding on the wood and dead plant matter. The termites' ability to decompose dead wood makes them an important part of the planet's ecosystem. They are found in the colder areas as well, but they play a limited role in decaying of wood in the comparison of fungi and bacteria so fungi and bacteria are more uh, more prominent and they play very important role than the termites in the ecosystem so around 3000 species of termites are across the world including the ones that consume plant material and even soil the most famous are the wood eating termites So these wood eating termites were able to survive in warm and dry conditions and not much in the cold conditions unlike microbes that need to need water to grow so therefore with tropicalization that is a warming shifts to tropic tropical climates termite that termite wood decay will likely increase as termites excess more of the earth's surface so every 10 degree increase in temperature the termites decomposition goes up by almost 7 times 
So these termites decompose wood at a much higher rate in the warmer conditions. And as the earth gets warmer, the termites will rapidly spread across the world. That is tropicalization. And this could lead to a further rise in global temperatures because these termites, while consuming dead wood, release carbon into the atmosphere. And more atmospheric carbon increases the global warming. Are you getting my point? So more the global warming, more termites and these termites again will add to the global warming. Next is about XBB 1.5. This is a recombinant variant that may drive new surges. And uh, this was a news because India's first case of XBB 1.5 subvariant of Omicron was confirmed in Gujarat by the National Genome Sequencing Consortium. So we should from this uh, because it was news we should know something about this XBB 1.5. It is a subvariant sublineage of Omicron. It mutated from XBB strain, which itself is a recombinant. So it is a nicknamed. Uh, it is nicknamed as Kraken, a mythological sea monster, by an evolutionary professor on Twitter. So COVID variants are currently officially named by an expert group which is convened by the WHO and it follows the Greek alphabet for variants of concern. Uh, the last Greek named variant is Omicron. Okay, so you should understand these two statements. The recombinant means its genome is the product of the genomes of two different strains spliced together and it, it can happen in two ways. When two strains infect a person at the same time, a recombinant variant is produced as a replicate together and when existing recombinant strains mutate, a recombinant strain arises. So previous recombinants of COVID-19 are XD that is Delta plus Omicron, XEBA plus Point 0.1 and BA.2, XBB, BA2.101, BA2.75 and this XBB strain mutated further and became this XBB 1.5. This was also a descendant from XBB and it accounted for 14% of the new cases in India around mid-December 2022. The defining mutation is F486P, which is a part of virus's receptor binding domain, the part of the spike protein attaches the virus to a cell. The receptor binding is an important site that antibodies against the Omicron variant target and this is more immune, evasive and more transmissible. The original vaccines still continue to be effective as it does not appear to cause severe disease. Original antigenic sin A phenomena whereby repeated boosting saturates the immune system and mitigates its response to the future shots. Next topic we are going to see is the poor beam. This was a news because the Assam cabinet approved the construction of eight underpasses in seven jumbo corridors between Azara and Kamakya railway stations along the boundary of the conservation strategy and also uh, helping the animals not to come in conflict with the vehicles as well as humans. So here you can see in the map uh, they are planning an underpass in seven jumbo corridors. It is between Azara and uh, Kamakya railway stations. This is in the boundary of Deepore Beel. This is a permanent, Deepore Beel is a permanent freshwater lake in the Kamrup district of Assam. Uh, it is 4,014 acre beel is located in the southwest of Gavati city. It is a riverine wetland lying in the former channel of the Brahmaputra river and lies to the south of the main river channel. So it was designated as a Ramsar site in 2002 for sustaining a range of aquatic life forms besides 219 species of the birds. So the poor beel is only Ramsar site in the Assam. Please remember the statement. This is the only Ramsar site in Assam. And it was uh, it is a riverine wetland and a former channel of Brahmaputra River and only Ramsar site in Assam. In 2021, the Environment Ministry notified it as eco-sensitive zone. Deepore Beel is also a bird sanctuary and an important bird area. 
It is home to various native and migratory birds which flock in the winter. Next is about the Siom Bridge. In, in this uh, infographics of the map, you can see here, uh, this it is built on Siom River in Arunachal Pradesh bordering China. So let's see why it was in news because the Union Defense Minister inaugurated the Siom Bridge in Arunachal Pradesh along with 27 other infrastructure projects. Uh, see, this bridge is a strategically important bridge over Siom River. I told you it is on Siom River in Arunachal Pradesh by the Border Roads Organization. So the bridge was hugely augmented by India's border in infrastructure, especially among the Chinese border from Ladakh to Arunachal. The Siom Bridge on the Along Inkyong Road is a 100 meter class 70 steel arch superstructure. This Along, Along Inkyong road shares over 3000 kilometer long border with china the, uh, around the line of actual control so this region it has a border with china around 3000 kilometer the bridge can withstand the movement of armored columns along with the artillery it will facilitate faster induction of troops heavily equipped and mechanized vehicles to forward areas of the upper siang district to ting and in Kiong. Next is Broadcasting Infrastructure and Network Development. So, Cabinet has approved the Central Sector Scheme Broadcasting Infrastructure and De Network Development with an outlay of 2,539 crore. So, it was in news because of that. The Cabinet Committee approved this BIND or the Broadcasting Infrastructure and Network Development Scheme for the Infrastructural Development of Prasar Bharati. So the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting implements the central uh, sector scheme of this BIND with an outlay of 2,539.61 crore up to 2025 and 26. This paves the way for upgrade and expansion of the public service broadcasting infrastructure across the country. The scheme provides financial support to Prasar Bharati for expenses related to the below functions. And one of the functions that has widened its reach, including the left extre uh, wing extremist border and strategic areas, provide high quality content for the domestic and international viewers. Digital upgradation of DD, that is Doordarshan and AIR, All India Radio Studios, to make them high defined. Increase coverage of AIR FM transmitters in the country. The scheme also envisages free distribution of over 5 la 8 lakh DD free dishes STBs to the people living in remote, tribal, LWE, and border areas. So, the benefits include development of high quality content for both domestic and uh, international audience, availability of diverse content by upgrading the capacity of DTG, DTH platform to accommodate more channels. Purchase of ob ones and digital upgradation of DD and AIR studios to make them HD ready. So the Prasar Bharati, that is the All India Radio and Doordarshan is the public broadcaster of the country. The most important vehicle of information, education, entertainment and engagement for the people, especially in the remote areas of the country through Doordarshan and All India Radio. So, at present, Doordarshan operates 36 TV channels, include, including 28 regional channels, and All India Radio operates more than 500 broadcasting centers. The next topic is widow war. It was a news because scientists have discovered a species that can heat huge numbers of infectious viruses that share their aquatic habitat. These virovores are organisms that eat and survive on viruses. A species of Halteria can eat huge numbers of infectious chloroviruses that share their aquatic habitat. This Altera is a microscopic ciliate that lives in the freshwater worldwide. Ciliates are a single-celled organism with minuscule airs. These chloroviruses are made up of nucleic acids, lot of nitrogen and phosphorus. Altheria not just eat viruses, but they thrive only on the virus-only diet. So this is an organism which eats and survives only on virus. So next topic is about the superconductivity in mercury. 
So this was a news because a group of researchers from Italy have published a paper to fully understand how superconductivity operates in mercury. So mercury Hg is known as quicksilver and is the only elemental metal that is liquid at room temperature used in thermometers, barometers and manometers only because of this quality as it is only elemental metal that is liquid as, at the room temperature. So mercury poisons leads, leads to Minamata disease. And mercury is the earliest known superconductor. So now what is superconductor? It conducts electricity with zero resistance to flow the electrons and generally achieved at very low temperatures. So Bardeen Cooper's Schrieffer theory was proposed by Bardeen Cooper and Schrieffer in 1957 for which they won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1972. So the theory is the first theory to explain superconductivity as a microscopic theory and uh, according to this theory in superconductors the vibrational energy released by the grid of atoms encourages electrons to pair up forming the so-called Cooper pairs. One electron in each pair in mercury occupied a higher level than the other and reportedly lowered the coulomb repulsion between them. So these Cooper pairs can move without facing resistance to the flow below a threshold temperature. Coulomb repulsion is the repulsive force between two positive and negative charges as described by the Coulomb's law. The next is about photovoltaics. This was a news because 5 megawatt plant is set to foray in the Singareni thermal power plant. So this is the floating solar plant installed at Singareni power plant. It is established in the reservoir at Peg Pegadapalli in Mancherial district of Telangana. So these floating solar plants or floating voltaics are called flotavoltaics. So these are called flotovoltaics. There are panel structures that are installed on the water bodies like lakes, basins, reservoirs instead of on solid structures like roofs or terraces. So it covers 10% of the world's hydropower reservoirs with photovoltaics would install electrical capacity equivalent to that provided by all electricity generating fossil fuel plants in the operation worldwide. So the benefits are they do not take up much land which can be used for other purposes. The water's cooling effect makes them more efficient than land-based ones. They don't interfere with desert ecosystems. They keep precious water from evaporating. They reduce algal blooming. Next is about the cyber threat prediction reports of 2023. It was a news because security solutions firm that is Barakuda has shared its cyber threats prediction for 2023. In 2023, organizations need to be ready to be targeted by every kind of cyber threat regardless of their size or industry sector. So against the backdrop of geopolitical conflict, some of the top cyber threats uh, trends that organizations need to be ready for 2023 are ransomware, a zero-day vulnerability, supply chain attacks, credential theft, exploitation of vulnerabilities in IoT, Internet of Things, exploitation of authentication methods. Attack surfaces. The increase in the adoption of cloud-based and software as a service office offerings with remote work continuing will increase the number of potential attack surfaces. Ransomware organizations will experience an increased frequency of ransomware attacks with new tactics and with increased use of wiperware. Targeted ransomware against individuals from their social media account will also increase. Ransomware as a service business models are taking off and a new generation of smaller and smarter gangs are likely to become more prevalent. Wiperware attacks emanating from Russia will likely spill over into other countries with continued geopolitical tensions. So what is this wiperware? It's a ransomware which ensures data destruction upon completion of the task. So zero-day vulnerabilities, more zero-day vulnerabilities are also expected to take place with close to 21,000 common vulnerabilities and exposures being registered in 2022. While many of these were classified as critical and many were actively exploited by the attackers. Credential theft, these credentials open the door for remote access, email and corporate web applications storing the customer data. 
authentication methods is multi-factor authentication and TOTP, that is time-based one-time passwords. They're increasingly susceptible to social engineering cyber attacks. So impersonation techniques, peer phishing attacks and multi-factor authentication fatigue attacks uh, is nothing but multi-factor authentication fatigue attack is also known as MFA bombing or MFA spamming. This MFA fatigue attack is a social engineering cyber attack strategy where attackers repeatedly push second factor authentication requests to the target victim's email, phone or registered devices. Next is about the Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion. Here, the first Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion meeting of the G20 will begin in Kolkata. This is a three-day meeting. will focus on the principles of digital financial inclusion, remittance costs, and SME finance availability. So, 12 international speakers will attend this G20 meeting, including senior officials from the World Bank, Monetary Authority of Singapore, France, and Estonia. So the Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion was officially launched on 10th December 2010 in Seoul. It, uh, the GPFI is an inclusive platform for all the G20 countries who are interested on G20 countries and relevant stakeholders to carry forward work on financial inclusion. It also carried forward the implementation of the G20 Financial Inclusion Action Plan endorsed at the G20 Summit in Seoul. So other GPFI's efforts are helping countries put into practice the G20 principles for innovative financial inclusion, strengthening data for measuring financial inclusion, developing methodologies for countries wishing to set the targets. The next one is about black buck. This was a news because a study conducted by the Indian Institute of Science has shed light on how black buck in India have fair challenges to their survival. So black buck or antelope cervicapra is also known as Indian antelope. The males have crockscrew shaped horns like this and black to dark brown coat, while the females are usually hornless. It is considered the fastest animal in the world next to cheetah. And the spread of this black buck is endemic to the Indian subcontinent and is found in India, Nepal and Pakistan. The animals are mainly seen in three broad clusters across India that pertains to northern, southern and eastern regions. So around 4,000 black bucks found in 39 villages outside the national park. 18 black bucks have died between August 11 and 13. 20,000 acres le land was leased out for salt pans in 2018. So the habitat for the black buck are grassy plains and slightly forested areas. Significant trait, the male black buck disperse more than females to maintain the gene flow in the species. Threats are habitat destruction, habitat fragmentation, increased anthropogenic activities. The conservation status is Wildlife Protection Act 1971. It is Schedule 1 species. IUCN is near threatened and sites is Appendix 3. The Tal Chapar Sanctuary is known as the home of Black Buck. The Bishnoi sect of people in Rajasthan are called the protectors of this Black Buck. Indian Skimmer. The Godavari Eshuri in Andhra Pradesh has become a prime and safe habitat for the Indian Skimmers. The Indian Skimmers, which can swim, skim over water to snap up fish, is characterized by a bright orange bill. They are found in the coastal estuaries of western and eastern India and the habitat occurs primarily on larger sandy lowland rivers around the lakes and adjacent marshes and in the non-breeding season in the estuaries and coasts. So distribution is presently confined only to India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal and Myanmar and it is considered as extinct in Lao, PTR, Cambodia and Vietnam. So in India, about 20% of the total population of fewer than 2,500 birds nest along the river Chambal and around 250 Indian skimmers were sighted in the Koringa Wildlife Sanctuary in a day during the Asian Water Bird Census 2023, which we discussed in the first topic. The diet is, it feeds on surface dwelling fish, small crustaceans and insect larvae. The threats are obviously habitat degradation, excessive and widespread increases in the disturbance of rivers and predation and the conservation status is IUCN endangered. The Koringa Wildlife Sanctuary is important from your examination point of view. It is in the East Godavari district of Andhra Pradesh and it is a tidal mangrove forest along the Godavari estuary. 
About 40% of the sanctuary is only sea backwaters and the sea coast of the sanctuary is breeding ground for olive ridley turtles. Global Combat Air Program. This was a news because UK, Italy, Japan have announced the Global Working Mechanism for the Global Combat Air Program, GCAP, which is a new partnership to develop the combat jets. UK, Italy, Japan have announced the team for sixth generation global combat air program. It's an ambitious and the we are to end, uh, develop a next generation fighter aircraft by 2035. So the merger, Japan's FX fighter jet program was merged with UK and Italy's Tempest program to create the global combat air program. This will leverage both from the Tempest and FX programs. The new jet will replace Japan's F-2s and Britain's Typhoon fighters. The F-35 and C GCAP, all three countries are already part of the US 5th generation F-35 stealth fighter program while the F-35 program will continue, the focus will shift towards the 6th generational upgrades. Under this F-35 program, all three contribute the development of the F-35 and the different versions of the warplane are assembled in Italy and Japan. So India is going to design the new stealth fighter and India is beginning the preliminary design work for a new fifth generation fighter jet named AMCA and with the first flight scheduled for 2024. CCTPP, that is Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for TTP. This commission is in accession negotiations with the United Kingdom. So who are in it? Japan, Vietnam, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Mexico. Who is yet to ratify it is Brunei, Malaysia, Peru and Chile. So this comprehensive and progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership is a free trade agreement between 11 countries in the Asia-Pacific region and the agreement would lower the tariffs and other trade barriers among the 11 countries. So the signatories are Australia, Brunei, Canada, Chile, Japan, Malaysia, Mexico, New Zealand, Peru, Singapore and Vietnam. It entered into force on December 30, 2018 with six countries to have ratified the agreement. That is Canada, Australia, Japan, Mexico, New Zealand and Singapore. Bharat Pravah, uh, the Union Minister for Shipping, Waterways and Ports have launched an initiative, Bharat Pravah along India along its shores. The Ministry for Shipping, Waterways and Ports is organizing this Bharat Pravah in, in collaboration with the Institution for Governance, Policies and Politics, which is a think tank. The initiative aims to highlight the importance of river ports, shipping in the everyday life of the common man through literature, dialogue and communication. The initiative plans to organize a series of regional, national and international events with dialogues and conferences throughout the year around eight themes. So intellectuals, influencers, practitioners of the society are invited to debate, discuss and exchange the dialogues and policies, perspectives and problems of the shipping sector. So these events would yield a set of new literature on the significance of the ports or railways or shipping in every day. But you should remember this Bharat Prava is an initiative by Union Minister for Shipping, Waterways and Ports. The Italian Hydra Par project was a news. It is in Arunachal Pradesh and has been scrapped in its present form and the Forest Advisory Committee asked Arunachal Pradesh to review it. So this Italian Hydro Power project is a joint venture of Jindal Power Limited and Hydro Power Development Corporation of Arunachal Pradesh Limited. The 3097 megawatt Italian Hydro Power a project, this was here, will be one of the biggest hydro uh, power projects in India in terms of installed capacity. The project envisaged in 2008 is a combination of two run of the river schemes and involves the construction of concrete gravity dam dams on the Tangoon and the Dri rivers. Dri and Tangoon will come here and we will have a dam. The project will require the diversification of 1,165.66 acres of forest land and the felling of more than 280,000 trees in the area. So it ran into several controversies over concerns of ecological damage, forest invasion and tribal displacement. So please remember where this project is and on which rivers, that is Tangon and Dree rivers, uh, where it will be constructed. 
So the Italian uh, hydro power project is a village in the Dibang Valley district of Arunachal Pradesh. River Dibang is a tributary of Brahmaputra. We already saw uh, one more river here that is Sarsa Rivulet, which was tributary of Satluj. Here, this is Ita River Dibang, tributary of Brahmaputra River, flows through the states of Arunachal Pradesh and Assam. Dibang consists of three major rivers and three other small rivers. The major tributaries are Dri, Matun, and Talon. Smaller tributaries are Ahi, Ava, and Emra. So, all of them comes under the Brahmaputra River system. So the concerns is it is very important habitat for many Schedule 1 endangered species including genetically distinct population of tigers, 75 species of other mammals and over 300 species of birds. This Dibang Valley forms part of the Eastern Himalaya Global Biodiversity Hotspot which is one of the 36 such global biodiversity hotspots across the world. The Idumishmi uh, animist tribe in the Dibang Valley will be directly affected. The issue is Italian hydroelectric project has been rejected in its present form by the Forest Advisory Committee in face of overwhelming opposition to its construction. So please remember who is going to uh, cancel the pro hydroelectric projects when it has faced any environmental const uh, constraints. So FAC also suggested the formation of a high level empowered committee to look into various concerns raised by large representations against the project. So you should remember this uh, tribes, Idumishmi tribes, the animist tribes of Dibang Valley. So thank you and we will see in the GS3 part 2 in our next video.